Did Charles Smith say it was the best lap? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's right. It ain't nothing to be. It's the Lord's work. This is where true worship again. That's what I told. I had a chance to go speak to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes a couple of Fridays ago. And I told those kids, you know, the music's great and all that. And it is it's wonderful. That's not worship. Worship is when we open up this Bible and right begin to preach what's in it. What the Lord has to say. That's true worship. That is true worship. So thank God for another opportunity to be able to come to his house and to worship him. So with that said, if you will turn to Romans chapter 12, if you will. Romans chapter 12. Now this morning, we're going to continue on with our message, our sermon on the duties of a Christian. We're going to pick back up in verse 4, uh, right where we left off. And uh, we're going to take off from there. So if you find your place, I want you to please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. But we're going to begin again in verse 13, where it says we need to be contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless, the, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own est estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, I like that right there. A little part right there. If possible, as so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Pray God, thank you for your mercy, for your grace, and this time that we can come together and preach your word. Lord, may everything that's said and done from this pulpit today will bring you glory and uplift in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, you know every person that walked through this door today. Every person that's here needs to be here to hear this message. God, you, you've read it, you, you've led them. And brought them here for this for this message today. So, Lord, I pray that you speak to their hearts. For those who see this video, I pray, Father, that it will speak to theirs as well, wherever they're at, whatever they're doing, as they sit and listen. God, that you will be glorified and lifted up in their life, and Lord, that you speak to them. And if there's someone that's lost and doesn't know you as Lord, that it will be draw, that it will draw them to you, to your lordship. Lord, have your will and your way with us this day. And we ask all these things in Christ's name with thanksgiving. Amen. Be seated. Yeah, if you don't mind, uh, put that heat down if you don't mind. So it's a bit warm up under these fry burners up here. So just to bring us back up to speed now, and if you if you weren't here last Sunday, you need to go back, you need to go back to YouTube and type in North Place for Rabbit Church, look up the title, the, the Duties of a Christian, and see that message. And that way you can tie all these points together. Okay? Because this is a continuation of last week. And so I just want to bring us back up to speed. That last point we covered concerning the duties of a Christian was that we are to be purposeful in ministry. Now I'm going to give you, I'm going to kind of rehash everything, kind of bring us back up to speed here. Paul says we're to be contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. The Greek word there for contributing is the word koinonia, and it comes, it means to come into communion or to fellowship with one another or to share with one another or to make make, make it a partner. It comes from the Greek word koinonia. Which brings this, which means sharing with others in order to meet the needs of the saints. The first occurrence of that word koinonia is found over in Acts chapter two, verse forty-two, where uh, Luke wrote this. He said they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and koinonia, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. All believers, all believers, listen to me, should look forward to having a time. Of, of fellowship with one another, like we did last Sunday and after the service, we had a time to break bread together. I enjoyed that time. That is a time of fellowship between members, between believers in Christ. But we should also look forward to sharing the needs with the other saints as well. But what about those people who are outside the fellowship of the church? And what I'm talking about, I'm talking, I'm not talking about people that are members of the church. I'm talking about people that are not a member of the family of God. I hear people say this all the time. You too. We're all God's children. No, we're not. We're all God's creatures. 
But not everybody's a child of God. Until you surrender to the Lordship of Christ, you're not a child of God. Amen. That's the way it is. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, we see this. The Lord made it clear that as Christians, we have a responsibility to help others. With the best of our ability, we're to help and at least offer help to someone or anyone that we that may be in need that we may encounter. I've had that opportunity several times working in Charlotte. To some guy coming to me said he was hungry. I said, okay, let's go get something to eat. So I bought him lunch. I'm not telling you that to brag on me, but it was the guy that needed, he had a need. He had a, a genuine need. And before we ate, we asked the blessing. You know, bless the food. We want to be a hands and feet of Christ to this gentleman. That's what we're to do. But what better opportunity to be a living sacrifice and a testimony of a Christian is to love an unbeliever, to help him in a, in a, in a time of need. And if we're to serve in such a capacity to an unbeliever, guess what? Take note of this now. If we're to do that for an unbeliever, we have an even greater responsibility to be of service to our fellow believers. Here's what Paul said, Galatians 6.10. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially, listen to this part, to those who are of the household of faith. Paul says right here in our text, we're to be practicing hospitality, metaphorically speaking. Practicing means to pursue, to eagerly seek for those who are in desperate need to be ministered to. And the idea here is to purposely run and find these people to show them kindness. The Greek word for hospitality is the word philosophia. It's a compound word. The phileo means brotherly love, and then the word zenia means strangers. And you know about the word xenophobia means to be afraid of strangers, to have a fear of strangers. This is the total opposite. We're to look for these people. We're to love the stranger. The idea here is to be the hands and feet and the mouth of Christ. We're to philoxenia. We're to show them hospitality and kindness. April 30th this year. I know Alan went to the meeting, and I believe Lydia was at the meeting. April 30th, they, they dubbed it the Love Anson. They've done this last year. We are going to have to, what it is that they want to reach out, some sort of outreach ministry that day. It's kind of like a mass, massive outreach on that one day. Okay? So we're going to get together and we're going to talk about this thing and see what we can do as a church to, to do something on that day. But you know what's saying? That we have to designate a day especially for that. That should be an everyday occurrence for the believer. Amen? Amen. Amen. That should be a, a daily occurrence for us as believers. When we see someone in need, especially someone we know that doesn't know Christ as Lord, and to share the good news of the gospel with them. This type of hospitality has been around since forever. When the, when the Jews came out of Egypt, you all know the story, they roamed around out there in the desert because of their sin. But when they finally got to go into the land, God told them, I want you to remember where you came from, remember what you went through, and when the stranger comes in, you, you need to meet that stranger at the gate, and you need to help that stranger, you need to show them hospitality. They were to open their homes and their hearts to these people. So how does that work for us in today's culture? Because of Satan and his evil influence of sin, I don't know anybody who will readily open their home to a stranger. And it's a shame because sin has so corrupted our society that it prevents us from carrying out the Lord's mandate to the fullest. But here's the thing. Even though we're not going to physically open our homes up to someone who's a stranger, might be coming in to do inventory, you're afraid they might want to come in and rob you or whatever, such thing. We should still open up our hearts and our hands to others in need. And there should never, never be nothing that pre pre prevent us from speaking, opening our mouths to share the gospel of Christ. We are to purposely pursue, to eagerly seek after someone who needs to hear that there is hope in Christ. Paul said in Acts chapter 20, verse 26, he says, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Meaning his conscience was clear. Paul never failed to take, to take the opportunity to share the gospel with anyone. He always shared the gospel. Uh, as I told you last week, he was probably a pain tool because that's, every time they say, oh, here comes, that, here comes that preaching Jew again. Yeah, he came to share the gospel with these people who needed to hear about Jesus. He, he pursued strangers to share the love of Christ. And it's easy for us. It's easy to invite other believers. It's easy to invite people we know into the fellowship. But to pursue strangers for the purpose of sharing the gospel is more demanding. But guess what? That's our mandate. That's what God said we're supposed to do. We're not only to meet the needs of believers and unbelievers who cross our path, but we're to purposely look for opportunities to help and share our faith. 
Hebrews 13, 2 says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for this, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing. And of course, 1 Peter 4, 8 through 9, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. But here's another sad truth. As noble and as pure as our intentions may be, because of sin's corruption, there will be those times when we're going to be head on with people that are very unwelcoming and just downright hateful and have a bad attitude. It's going to happen. And it's times like that when it's really easy for just for us to, you know, just give up. Well, what's the point? Why should I do that? All I'm going to, be is, all I'm going to do is meet negativity or a bad response. But worse than that, those are times when we allow our old man to resurrect long enough to strike back. Remember what Bob said about having a filter? That's right, Bob. We've got to have a filter. A lot of times. This is exactly what the enemy wants us to do. He wants us to lash back out. Who in here besides the preacher is guilty of striking back? Every hand said, well, I said a few hands. Some of y'all ain't quite as honest with it as everybody else. I, but I get it. But you, you know, I can say, well, Donnie, that's human nature. I mean, we respond negatively to hateful people when they respond negatively to us. Or, or purposely speak ill of us. Or our character, we're going to respond back. No, that's not human nature. God didn't create us to be that way. He created us in His image. That's our sin nature. And that's our sin nature giving our old man mouth-to-mouth resuscitation to resurrect for those moments of retaliation. And I believe there are some people who purposely keep their old man on life support. <laughs> yeah. Because they're looking for that opportunity. I was sharing with a fellow one time, uh, getting here just a week or two ago, back in the BC days, I knew this guy named Rob. Yeah, I keep remembering Rob's last name. Rob was from West Virginia. Rob was about this tall, built like a fire plug, and he was one of those guys who loved to go out on a Friday and Saturday night and look for a fight. This, the moment somebody said something, he's, ah, oh, there it is. And he was excited about it because he wanted to fight. Well, there are people like that in the church that wear their feelings on their sleeve. They wear their heart on their shoulder. They, they are so easily offended, and they look for that opportunity to lash out and to lash back. That, folks, that's not the way it's supposed to be. It shouldn't be that way. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Look, the plug has been pulled on the old man. Don't plug him back up. Leave him lifeless and let Christ live his life through you. Now here's where I'm going with all this. As purposeful as we are to be in pursuit of contributing to the needs of the saints and practicing, practicing hospitality, we're to be just as purposeful when it comes to blessing those who despise us. Look at verse 14. Paul says, bless those who persecute you. I'm going to read this again. Bless and do not curse. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. I want you to understand what he's saying here. This, he wasn't calling for us to bless those who occasionally insult us. Okay? It goes a lot deeper than that. A lot deeper than that. To truly bless those who persecute us is to treat them as if they're our friends. That hurts, don't it? Boy, that, that, just don't, that does not suck well, does it? Well, listen, I'm going to tell you what. It's not impossible. It's not impossible. Do you realize when Paul penned these words, he was under verbal and physical persecution? His whole entire ministry, he was verbally assaulted, he was physically assaulted, and yet he purposely went to these people, seeking them out, and he said this, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. We've all been insulted. Every one of us in here has been insulted. We've had people say hateful things about us. But there's not one soul in this room, and there's not one soul that's going to see this video that has ever faced the type of persecution that Jesus and Paul faced. So don't tell me that we can't bless someone who looks sideways at us or, or says something ugly about us. Because we can. And we must. If we don't, we'll be guilty of grieving the Holy Spirit. How do you grieve the Holy Spirit? By not allowing Him to reveal Himself through us in the way that He wants to, through our words, our actions, and through our attitude. Or when we just flat out don't do, when we do what we know is wrong, we grieve the Holy Spirit. But here's where I had to stop and do some repenting of my home. There are several people that I know that have a personal dislike for me for one reason or another. I know y'all find it hard to believe. <laughs> 
but, but there are. There are. There's one in particular, uh, this one person, I have no clue why they're mad at me, because they won't tell me. They won't reconcile. They don't want to reconcile. They would rather hang on to that bitterness than reconcile. Have I prayed for these people? Yes, I have. But, listen to me, I didn't pray, Lord, bless them. I prayed, Lord, break them. Now, that's, that's a good prayer, but that's not what Paul said to do. He said, pray to bless them. Pray to bless them. R.C. Sproul said this. He said, Paul's response to persecution was to bless his enemies, not to curse them. Refraining from cursing our enemies is not too difficult, but to bless them, to pray, God, to pray that God would bestow upon them his favor and grace is much harder. Doing so is tough. But it is what love means. Distinctive Christian love seeks to bless those who do terrible things to us. They do, they do, they do us harm. And when we are purposeful in seeking to carry out our duties as Christians, we'll find that those duties will also include becoming partakers. That's our next point. Partakers with those whom the Lord has brought into our lives, whether they be friend or whether they be foe. Look at verse 15. Here's where we have one, we have one verse here that has two different actions taking place, two different attitudes, and I'm going to look at them separately. First, rejoice with those who rejoice. Now when you first read this, it seems simple enough to understand and to follow, but I want y'all to consider these examples. Perhaps a friend or a fellow believer, someone you know, gets a promotion or a reward that we thought we should have gotten, that we should have received that. And maybe they got this promotion or blessing that maybe they received it at our expense. Or their accomplishment made ours look less than average. Think about that for a second. How would we respond? Can we rejoice with them in their achievement and forget about our loss? Or will we allow our old flesh, our old man, to rise up in resentment? How, how, how would we respond to that? Before you answer that, and you ain't got to answer it out loud, answer it to yourself. But remember this, Cain let his resentment kill his brother. And Judas is resentment built up and he betrayed the Son of God. <clears throat> Think about that. Regardless of our personal circumstances, the person who belongs to the body of Christ should rejoice in the blessing of others. This is how the body of Christ is knit together. If one rejoices, everybody should rejoice. Sproul said there are no politics of envy in the kingdom of God. Sadly, however, there are those who see with jealousy and anger at the recognition of others. This, they hold fast to that wrongful attitude until it becomes their downfall because they refuse to repent of it. And with that attitude, they openly rebel against the Scripture, what well, Scripture commands all believers. And I want you to look at verse, and this is 1 Corinthians 26. This, we're going to look at the last part of that verse first. He says, if one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. That's what we're supposed to do. Albert Barnes wrote this. He said, in this way happiness diffuses and multiplies itself. It, it becomes expanded over the face of all, the whole society. And the union of the Christian body tends to enlarge the sphere of happiness and to prolong the joy conferred by religion. God has bound the family of man together by these sympathies and it is one of the happiest of all devices to perpetuate and extend human enjoyment. Next, I want you to look at the next portion of verse 15. He says, we're to weep with those who weep. Now, when one, when one of us weeps, all of us should be right there with him. We should partner up inside of him, wrap our arm around him and weep with him. We're to be sensitive to each other's disappointments and hardships. Looking back again at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26. It says, and this time we're going to look at that last part. He says, if one, or the first part, if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. That is what the body of Christ is all about. When Paul came in contact with sorrowful people, he sorrowed with them. And the greatest example of this is none other than the Lord himself. Think about this for a minute. When, when, when Lazarus died, Jesus went to the home of Martha and Mary, and the Bible said in John 11, 35, Jesus wept. I think the first message I ever preached here was on Jesus wept. And Jesus wept for multiple reasons. Number one, because he knew the effects of sin and what was taking place. What took place was the unnatural rending of the soul from the body. When we were created, the soul and the body was not supposed to come apart. They were supposed to remain together. But because of sin, the flesh died. 
Okay, so the body goes to the ground, returns to the dust, the soul lives forever. But when the resurrection happens, and we as Christians go up to meet God, the glorified body and the soul are going to come back together again. We were meant to stay together. But Jesus wept because he knew that, saw, that Lazarus' soul had been torn from his sinful body. And he wept. But guess what? Let's get to the human side of it. He wept with the sisters because they just lost their brother. More so than losing their brother, they lost their livelihood. They lost their protection because he was, in that society, women were very vulnerable. And they needed a male figure. We got a husband, a brother, a son, a grandson, whomever it was, they needed a male figure. And these ladies were in the deck, going to be in dire straits, and they knew it. But they lost their brother, who they loved. My brother died back in May. I miss my brother. Anybody here just lost a sibling, you know what I'm talking about. You miss that person. These ladies missed their brother, and so they wept. And so Jesus wept. He felt their grief, and he wept with them. He was 100% God, but he was 100% man. He understood what they were feeling. Here's another illustration. This was a custom that was practiced back in ancient Jerusalem. As one group of worshipers would leave the temple, there's another group coming in. Okay? And they would go out, the door would go out the same way. And as they came in, and as, as the ones were going out and the ones coming in met, they would bump into each other and they would squeeze by one another. And these two groups would come face to face. And those sad faces of those experienced sorrow, they would, they would be seen from the opposite side from others. And in those brief moments, their grief would be shared. They shared grief with one another. Today's culture is too consumed with this own coming and going to acknowledge the grief that others are experiencing or going through in a passing moment. We're commanded to be partakers in each other's lives, but now I'm going to speak specifically about being partakers in the lives of other believers. Look at verse 16. Paul says, be of the same mind toward one another. What's he talking about? We have to have a certain kind of affection for one another as believers. We're not to reserve our love for a particular uh, small group or clique in the church. We're to distribute our affections evenly to the whole body of Christ. Let me give you an example from Scripture. James chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4 and then verse 9. My brethren, do not hold your faith in, glorious, in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes to you, or comes into your assembly, excuse me, with a gold ring, dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among, among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Now verse 9. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Romans 12 to, uh, excuse me, Romans 2 to 11 says, For there is no partiality with God. There, are, there is none. If there's no partiality with God, there shouldn't be any partiality within us. Look at that next portion of verse 16. He says, Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the low. We never think more of ourselves than we should. We should never covet the high positions or recognition that comes with that. Instead, we should choose humility and always partake in the lives of those who may be viewed by the world as insignificant. Or, as Paul calls them, the lowly. Donald Ray Barnhouse wrote this in his commentary. He said, The Lord Jesus loved to be with ordinary people. He was at ease in the taverns and the by places haunted by the outcasts of his day. He incurred the sneers of the proud and haughty who were more afraid for their reputations than for their characters. The believer who is filled with the Holy Spirit will find it easy to fit into the mood of those to whom he witnesses. You understand what he's saying there? How to get, get in with that person who you're trying to witness to, regardless of that person's station in life? You, ever, you know what I'm talking about? There's an example that's been out here for years, and I'm sure it's made its way around the world, or at least it's made its way across this country. And y'all probably heard it before, but I'm going to say it again just in case you ain't never heard it. There was a, the example that I heard was given on the radio. I was listening to this guy preach. This church was packed slam full. Packed slam full. Wall to wall people. Nowhere to sit. Big revival going on. Big fancy church. Everybody in there dressed in the nines. Everybody's in there at the church. 
And the door opens up, and this young man comes in, and he's wearing a pair of jeans and a dirty T-shirt. And he's looking for a place to sit down, but ain't nobody sliding over letting him sit down. So he walks all the way up here to the front, and he sits down on the floor, and lays back, leans back against the wall, and listens to preaching. <coughs> All of a sudden, this old elderly gentleman who was sitting on the front row, probably an officer in the church, gets up, walks over to him. People probably thinking, well, he's going to throw him out. No. The old man got down there and sat down on the floor with him. Do you understand what that means? He, he, he put himself where he was at. So that the young man would not feel by himself. Another of our duties as Christians, we're to keep a humble and godly perspective. <coughs> That's our next point. At the end of verse 16, it says, Do not be wise in your own estimation. This is a quotation from Proverbs 33, 7. It says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Isaiah 5, 21 also warns, he says, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. In other words, don't be conceited and self-promoting because this almost always leads to unfavorable consequences. Men who puff themselves up, listen to me, Men who puff themselves up generally spoil their usefulness because once they think they know it all, you can't tell them anything. Once they've begun to know it all, they reject all counsel, they reject all advice, their behavior will turn into arrogance and rudeness and completely lacking of any grace whatsoever. This will then render them ineffective for reaching the lost of Christ because the only people that they will associate with are people who think just like them. And even then, even then, their overinflated egos will clash and will cause irreparable damage. Never think more of yourself than you should. Do you know people that fit this description? I do. And I'll be honest with you. They're absolutely nauseating. They're absolutely nauseating. But how much more nauseating and offensive are they to the weaker believer? How much, or worse, how much more nauseating and offensive are they to the people who live outside the family of God? Those are the ones that are going to be hurt. Those are the ones that are going to be hard to reach because they have come in contact. They've had the unfortunate displeasure of coming in contact with this person who thinks they're wise in their own estimation. Unless the Holy Spirit steps in and moves these people, those that are hearing this, those that's going to push away, they're going to, they're going to suffer the greatest loss in the end. Folks, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm the first to admit this. I do not have all the answers. I am not, I don't have a corner on, on, on the mind of God. I am not a walking commentary. I do not, I, I need understanding and insight before I can ever stand and preach what God's Word says. I come to, I read the Scripture, I pray and I ask God for discernment, and I depend on the leadership of the Holy Spirit to speak to my heart and help me get where I'm going. But I am not foolish enough to not believe that I believe my own press. Here's what I do. I start to research and I look at some of the greatest minds in the history of the church. See what they have to say about that passage that I'm trying to prepare. These guys that, that like to say, you know, I, I go up and I depend on the Holy Spirit to speak to me and, and I'll do whatever he says at, at that moment. I want to say, ain't no wonder your teaching is so shallow. Listen, here's what the Bible tells us. 2 Timothy 2, 15. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. And listen to these two words here. Accurately handling the word of truth. The Greek word there for accurately handling is orthotomeo. And frequently speaking, it means to dissect or expound correctly what the divine message is trying to say. I, I would be a foolish man to come here and tell you I have every answer in my mind of what this is saying. I, I do not. I have to study it. I have to pray over it. I have to, and I look at guys who are a lot smarter than me and to see if what I'm thinking agrees with what they're thinking. R.C. Sproul said this. He said, The preacher who stands in the pulpit should study the text of Scripture diligently and examine as much as possible the original languages in an effort to get an accurate understanding of the text. If he relies solely on his own intellect, listen to this, he is doomed. And if I may add to that, so is everyone else who sits under his shallow and erroneous teaching. I never ever will be that guy. I never, ever want to be that guy. I never want to be that guy that mishandles the Word of God or misleads one of His children. I never want to, be, to get up to the point that I think that I am wise in all estimation and that I am receiving counsel. I don't need to receive counsel from anyone else. I don't, I don't never want to be that guy. 
Next, concerning the duties of a Christian, we're to live peaceful lives. Look at verse 17. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Now, this is really a reiteration of, of verse 14. Now, we're to, to not only ask the Lord to bless our persecutors and not curse them, but we're to never strike back in retaliation. Now, this, this is tough right here. This, this really is. Because our natural response, our first response, is to lash out, is to, is to cause harm. In today's vernacular, we would say, it's payback time. And what goes around comes around. We say we want to get even. We do. We say we want to get even. But the truth is, we want to go one up. We want to do more than they did. We want to hurt them more. Paul says that such a human disposition, you know, which reigns, that reigns in the human heart, is a manifestation of corruption and an example of moral evil. But doesn't the Old Testament scripture say an eye for an eye and two for two? It does in several places. He said Exodus chapter 21, 24, Leviticus 24, 20, Deuteronomy 19, 21, and the Lord himself even preached on it in Matthew 5, 38 through 45. But what they preached on, you take, people take it out of context, what he preached on was civil justice. This is what it's talking about. To make sure that the punishment that is administered to the, is properly administered to the crime. It has nothing to do with personal revenge. In Romans 13, 4, Paul declares that civil authority is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is, it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. That's why I do not understand how these thugs today, and I mean, I mean thugs, really thugs, who are out there purposely breaking the law, holler police brutality when they're, they're, when they're openly hurting hurting, even killing them. If you, don't want to be if you don't want the law to come down on you, then don't do what's wrong. Do what's right. So if we're victims of someone's sin, even though our flesh wants satisfaction, we can't allow ourselves to pursue payback. The moment we do, then we become involved in sin, which is not the way of the Christian life. That's not the way it's supposed to be. We should never take delight in revenge. At the end of verse 17, it says, respect what is right in the sight of all men. The Greek word for respect is prononeo, which means to consider in advance. In other words, consider in advance what is right in the sight of all men before you do it. Before we make our next move, before we make our next decision, we must consider what impact it's going to have on those who are watching our lives. Listen to me. Like it or not, people are watching us. People are watching us. They, they cannot, uh, even if they don't know who they are, can believers see something different, or excuse me, unbelievers, can they see something different about us that they cannot deny even when they slander us? Do they see the characteristics of the Good Samaritan or do they see the characteristics of the Pharisee? Do they see that our word can be trusted? Other than Jesus himself, one of the greatest examples in the Bible would be Abraham, our man Abraham. Abraham was certainly not without his faults, but Abraham was held in high regard by the people who dwelt on land. Why? They watched his life. They saw how he dealt honorably with Lot when there when they was a dispute over the land. He gave him the first choice. Lot, I mean, so Abraham had every, had every right to say, Lot, you go there, I'll take the good stuff. He had every right to do that, but he didn't do that. He gave him the choice. They saw how he honored Melchizedek with a tenth of the spoils that he took from the four kings and how he didn't keep anything for himself that belonged to the king of Sodom. You're not going to say, you gave me this. You take what's yours. You take what's yours. They saw his substance. They saw everything that he accumulated from his fair dealings with those whom he did business with. And here's the, here's the big thing. They saw how he trusted his God and how God blessed him for his obedience. They saw that. They watched. They witnessed it. And when the day came that Sarah died, when Sarah died, Abraham comes to the sons of Heaven. These are pagan men. He comes to them to buy property, to bury her. And here's what they said to him. Listen. Genesis 23, 6. Hear us, my Lord. You are a mighty prince among us. He was way up here on their stand. Abraham was the man. He says, bury your dead in the choices of our graves. None of us will refuse you his grave for burying your dead. Well, several more words got passed. Before everything was all said and done, they eventually sold him the land per his request. But my point is this. God-fearing Abraham was honored among these pagan men because he first honored God 
by living a peaceful life. And, and so as hostile as the world may be to Christians, they're not blind. They're not blind. They can see the virtues of our faith in Christ. Even, even if they didn't refuse to acknowledge those virtues, they still know they're there. They still know they're there. And everybody will live happily ever after, right? Wrong. Wrong. Look at verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. And the term, if possible, is a strong indication that it may not always be possible to be at peace with all men. And the term, all men, includes Christians. All means all. Believer, non believer, Jew, Gentile, pagan, saint, whatever. It includes everybody. William R. Newell wrote this. He said, Alas, some real believers are thoughtless, some jealous, some envious, some possibly even spiteful. It's hard to believe that a, pres that a professing believer would be hateful to another fellow believer. But it happens. It happens. And we wonder why we can't get people to come to church. Because nobody wants to get involved in somebody's ecclesiastical feud. What it amounts to. But the fact is, whether it's between nations or individuals, listen, peace is a two-way street. It's a two-way street. By definition, peace cannot be a one-sided endeavor. The responsibility of every individual is to be sure that they have done everything they know to do, short of compromising God's truth, of course, to make sure that their side of the relationship is right. Amen? Amen. Amen. You do what you're supposed to do to make sure your side of the relationship is right. Regardless of what the other side does, we got to know that we're doing what the Lord is wanting us to do. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. If somebody offends us, don't strike back. Instead, seek peace with that person, not retaliation. We're to take the lead in seeing that there is peace and harmony in God's family, rather than discord and chaos. The lesson here is simple. It's simply this. The idea is that if every believer will do their part, there will be no place for trouble and disunity in God's house. MacArthur said this. He said, we must forsake any grudge or settle bitterness and fully forgive from the heart all who harm us. Having done that, we can seek re reconciliation honestly. Amen, amen. That's right. That's right. Okay, so what if the person with whom we've tried to make peace refuses to do their part? What then? The duties of the Christian say that we're to be patient. That's our next point. Look at verse 19. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Of course, the command here is obvious. It's obvious. We're commanded to not take matters into our own hands. When we've been offended, and our offender, believer or otherwise, refuses to reconcile with us, then we're to leave the matter in God's hands. It's never our place to get revenge. It is our place to bless those who persecute us. Revenge belongs to God. And understand this. Revenge in and of itself is not evil. What makes it evil is the one who undertakes that. The vengeance, if, if vengeance were left up to us while living in our fallen state, in this fallen flesh that we are in, we would never be satisfied until we inflicted more pain than the crime deserved. You can't never get them back enough. You understand what we're saying here? That's our measure of vengeance. That's when our measure of vengeance becomes sinful. Remember, the Lord saw everything that took place, and he'll see that the record gets set straight in his time by whatever means necessary. And when he does make the judgment, rest assured, it's going to be perfect. God never punishes more severely than this end cost. So what are we, what are we to do, be doing while patiently waiting on the Lord to exact his vengeance on those who have called us great harm? Next in line of the Christian duties, we're to be prepared. Look at verse 20. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now this entire verse it is taken almost literally from Proverbs chapter 25, verses 21 and 22. Hunger and thirst are, are put here, are, well, it's for want in general. If our enemy is needy in any, in any way, we're doing good. We're supplies need. 
And this is in the same spirit as, as the command that the Lord gave, Lord Jesus gave in Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 44, where he said, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In the same vein there. Let me tell you this. Several, several years ago, there was this young man living beside of us, and he was a vile preacher. He really was. He was hard to get along, could not get along with him for anything. He was one of those guys, if possible, okay? If possible. He calls my house, Rhonda's gone, the kids are all gone, and she might have been gone to get groceries at, at that point in time. But he calls my house and he leaves that ugly, I come home from work and there was an ugly message on my phone, on my answer machine. Every kind of curse word you can think about, he called me everything and put a fly with a lid on me, everything he said. It was bad. I'm hungry. Ain't nobody here and I can't get no food and blah, blah, blah. It just, it just got bad. So what did I do? I went down to a baseball bat and beat him dead. No, that's not what I did. <laughs> Here's what I did. Again, she's going to get groceries. Okay? We had a half a loaf of bread, had some bologna in the refrigerator, and a half a jar of mayonnaise. I scooped it up, put it in the bag, walked down there to him, but when he opened the door, his eyes got that great big round. He didn't expect to see me come there. Now, in my flesh, I wanted to go in there and punch him in the face. I did. I'll be honest with you. I mean, I can tell not the guy out for saying stuff like that. What if my family would have been home and heard that mess on the answer machine? But here's what I did. I handed him a slip. You hungry? I got you something right here. I said, this is all I got. She's going to get groceries. This is all I have. Well, Donna, that's okay. I said, no, no, no. You said you was hungry. I want you to have this. You keep this. And you eat it. In good health. And I turned and walked away. That's what I did. That's how we're to respond. As hard as it is to do that, and trust me, people, I'm telling you, it was hard to do that. But I did that. Because that's what the Lord impressed upon the heart. That's what I'm supposed to do. Did I ever reach the point for Christ? No, I did not. He is an individual that is different, very different. Don't know where he is today. Hopefully, hopefully something took place. Hopefully there was a seed planted and it has germinated and has brought forth good fruit. I hope and pray that's happened. But at that moment, I had to do what the Lord impressed upon me to do, and that was to feed my enemy. So since the Lord promises to deal with the offender and their offense, we're to be prepared. We're to always be prepared to obey his command and to reach out to these folks in love and humility. If they reject our hospitality, well, then that's between them and God because at that point, we've done everything the Lord has required for us to do. Rather than be all bummed out over the tears, we must be. We've got, we got to be like Jesus who literally blessed his enemies as he died. Do y'all remember what he said in Luke chapter 23, 34? Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. We're never, and listen, and when we can do that, there is never at any time that we're more Christ-like than them. That is God in this in action. That is Christ living in us for the glory of the Father. So our enemies can't compete with that. As verse 20 says, for in so doing, he will heat burning coals on his head. Coals of fire are no doubt emblematic of pain, right? Coming from an ancient, ancient uh, Egyptian custom, when a person wanted to demonstrate public repentance or remorse, he would carry a pan of hot coals on his head. And this represented the burning pain of his guilt and his shame. So the idea is for us not to call down vengeance on our offender, but to love him and genuinely seek to meet his needs and thereby shame him for his hate. That's what it's for. Albert Barnes wrote this, he said, burning coals heaped on a man's head would be expressive of intense agony. So the apostle says that the effect of doing so, of doing good to an enemy, would be to produce pain. But the pain would result from shame, remorse, of conscience, a conviction of evil of his conduct, and an apprehension of his of divine displeasure that may lead to repentance. To do this is not only to perfectly is not only perfectly right, but it is desirable. If a man can be brought to reflection and true repentance, it should be done. It should be done. The way to bring a man to repentance is to do him good. It is on this principle that God continually acts. He does good to all, even to the rebellious, and he designs uh, that his goodness should lead people to repentance. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? not knowing that the kindness of God leads to the man. And so for our, these last four duties of a Christian toward our enemy were to be peaceful, patient, prepared, and last of all, were to be pleasant. Look at verse 21. 
do not overcome, or excuse me, do not be overcome by evil, and overcome evil with good. Don't allow the evil that has been done to you to overcome you and to overwhelm you. Yeah, I, I understand how it is. Somebody does you wrong, and all you can think about is what they've done to you. You grit your teeth, and you want to go get them so bad you can't stand them. It happened to me too. With that same vile guy, yeah. prior to the bread and bologna, I should have checked that. But the Lord has impressed upon my heart when he saved me 11 months prior to that. Just trust me. Just trust me. Don't trust you, because if you get within your flesh, God ends, you'll mess everything. You'll go to jail. Just trust me. And I did. And God moved. Oh my goodness, did God move. God showed up, showed out. It was something else. It was something else. There are people. This, I said this earlier. There are people that seemingly look for someone to offend them so that they will have an excuse to express their bitter attitudes. When that happens, be pleasant. Be pleasant by being Christ-like in every situation. We can't con always control how people treat us, but we can control how we respond to them. So don't we ever come uh, by our own evil responses. Be pleasant, and the Lord will bless our lives. God blesses obedience. Amen? Amen. He does. So how do we measure up alongside of God's Word? And if you're like me, there's a whole lot to repent of and a whole lot of adjustments to be made in our lives. And, you know, if, we're going to, if we intend to do everything the Lord has done or has, has saved us to do, then we have to make those adjustments. And you'll get no argument out of me that living with other people is hard and sometimes it is downright exhausting because we're not always able to sync up and live in harmony. We know that. And since I'm not qualified to fix anybody, uh, anybody else, the best I can do is work on me and control me in God's prescribed manner. So today, if you're willing to be honest with yourself, and you know there are matters in your life that need adjusting, right now, you know it. You know it. You don't need me to tell you what they are. You already know what they are. And if you do, you're going to be honest with God. Take this time where you're at right now, and come down and take a knee and do business with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Because if you do business with God, guess what? That's what's going to eat you up, and it's going to continue working. That's a promise. That's a promise. When you can release, when you can release that bitterness, when you can make those adjustments in your life where you're able to be pleasant to a person who's being hateful to you, you ne you'll never understand what the, the blessing that that brings until you do. That is an awesome blessing. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Pray God, thank you for your mercy and grace to allow us to be here today. Lord, I pray that the Father that everything that's said and done here today is done correctly and in order that we correctly handle the Word. We accurately handle your Word today. Because God, we don't want to get it wrong. We don't ever want to get it wrong. Lord, we, we trust in you. We believe in you. We, we rest in you. We trust in your sovereignty. God, I pray that you take this word and speak to every heart here today. I pray that your will be done in every life that's here today. For those that see this video, I pray God will have a monumental effect on them as well. God, may we go out of here understanding this follow flesh is hard to live in. And this follow world hard to live God, if we put our faith and trust in you and to do what you have prescribed and your word says for us to do, how much better it will be. Lord, we leave this in your hands. We ask these things in Christ's name and thanksgiving. Amen. It's all